Ba-da. Bada boom. Sold. Huh? Just sold my car on Carvana. Dropping it off and getting paid today. Already? What? You still haven't sold yours? You told me about it months ago. I just... Is the offer good? Oh, the offer's great. Don't have another car yet? I could trade it in for this car I love. Come on. What are we waiting for? Ah, you're right. Let's go. Whether you're looking to sell your car right now or just whenever feels right, go to Carvana.com and sell your car the convenient way. Terms and conditions apply. His code name's Jackal. He's an exceptional assassin. Streaming November 14th on Peacock. He will kill again unless we stop him. Academy Award winner Eddie Redmayne. You're paying me to kill him. I am charging you for getting away. The Jackal's here. Look at the exits. BAFTA Award winner Lashana Lynch. I will find him and I will kill him myself. I like to win. So do I. The Day of the Jackal. Streaming November 14th only on Peacock. Being a marketer is no sweat. You just have to manage dozens of channels, launch hundreds of campaigns, score thousands of leads, and... Okay, fine. It's a lot of sweat. Unless you have HubSpot's AI-powered marketing tools to help you do all that and more. Get started at HubSpot.com slash marketers. Need a holiday gift that will keep her sparkling all year long? Blue Nile, the original online jeweler, has experts on hand 24-7 who can help you find the perfect piece. Beyond that, Blue Nile makes the gifting experience easier than ever with guaranteed free shipping and returns as well as a wide assortment of jewelry of the highest quality at the best price. Right now, get 30% off jewelry at BlueNile.com. That's BlueNile.com for 30% off. BlueNile.com. Have we had a self-sacked yet? <laughs> How do you self sack Is that when you do the Tom Brady and drop down before you get hit? And you give yourself up? Is that a self sack? I would say that's when Marilyn Manson rumored to have a rib removed. Whoa. Yeah. Settle down. I just settle down. <laughs> this was not on the Imani Bates draft profile, is that he had a rib removed. It would make sense if that were the case. We just got a self sack from Imani Bates, the former number one overall prospect of his class, now the second round pick of the Cleveland Cavaliers. He reposted a Remy workouts story. That had a photo of Imani Bates with the tag of 27 points, 8 of 12 field goals, 6 of 7 three-point field goals. Sounds like a good game. Yeah, pretty good. That's nice. Yeah, it did well. We see it now. LeBron James setting some trends of, hey, when you play well, it's okay to toot your own horn, you know? Yeah, toot that thing up. Except it was fake. It was a ball sack sports plant. Oh, wait, hold on. Oh, no. <laughs> Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. How's that possible? <laughs> Imani Bates did not have 27 points. He had 12 points in the game. He played in the game. He played in the game. What are we doing here? But Ballsack Sports tweeted out the stat line, steal of the draft, I emojis, and then a photo of Imani Bates in Vegas playing in a game. You know, I was about to say Ballsack Sports has slipped to posting fake player stat lines. That's what Ballsack Sports is doing right now. But then he got the player yeah. levels, man, with his own fake stat line. So he's a <laughs> genius again. God damn it. What? <laughs> I had the same thought. You know, there's some Easter eggs in Ballsack Sports tweets yeah. where you're just like, oh, there's the tell. There's the obvious thing. No quote, no graphic. Yeah. Just a stat line. The thing that just gets me, man, it says six to seven from three point land. And he shot one of five from downtown. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even close, man. It's so good. Is this like the Monopoly card bank error in your favor? Did he think the statistician glowed his lineup, glowed his numbers up? Maybe we're getting it all wrong. Maybe he did shoot six of seven from downtown. Balsack continues to raise the game. You know, we always talk about summer as like the time for NBA players to work on their games, add things to their repertoire, get in the weight room. Like ball sack has gotten in the weight room. The sack levels have been upgraded. Okay. When you are self sacking NBA players where they are tweeting out fake stats of their own game that they played in. Well, the retweeting, let's be fair. I guess <laughs> fair to money here. Well, to be fair to Monty Bates, he wasn't posting it. He was reposting it. He was actually reposting someone praising it. I don't know why I'm, I'm searching. I cannot believe someone would say, yeah, I, I did play well. <laughs> Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe he doesn't know his stats. He doesn't care about his stats. He's just going out there and playing basketball. Atta boy. So my guy, Pork Chop, Steve Jones, 
he pointed out that the joke's on all of us because Imani Bates spoke it to existence. He tweets out the ball sack stat uh-huh. in the next game. Listen to his stat line, 21 points, seven of 11 field goals and five of eight from three point land. All right. Joke's on us guys. Huh, huh. I guess we had to once again, acknowledge the mastery of one Imani Bates. The master bait. Master bait. What? <laughs> mastery baits. The sack mastery baits. There's something here. Sack master. Tom was talking about ball sack getting in the gym. So <laughs> <laughs> getting swole. Like blue shoe. My assignment. Uncover why the association inspires more conspiracy theories in volume and salience than any other U.S. sport. Now you've heard of the Illuminati. The truth is out there. But so are lies. Your eyes can deceive you. Don't trust them. The NBA has always been controlled by about eight people. Denial is the most predictable of all human responses. If you're only using 10% of your brain, you don't even know that you're using 10% of your brain. The NBA Illuminati. If coincidences are just coincidences, why do they feel so contrived? The Illuminati. But you start to follow the money, and you don't know where the f*** is going to take you. It is unspoken. They have influence among other players. The NBA Illuminati. I don't have time for your convenient ignorance. Maybe I'm a conspiracist now as well. That's but all it took. Oh, we got books, we got schools. You saw a video on YouTube. <laughs> Why am I, sir? You've never used them before. We are the basketball Illuminati. <laughs> is Basketball Illuminati. I am Tom Haberstra, and as always, I am joined by the five-star generals, Amin El Hassan and producer Anthony Mays. Fellas, man, I'm still reeling from the swollen ball sack hitting the gym. I want to say I got a doctor for that. I mean, you're in Vegas, the mayor of Vegas. I want to hear about the sphere. I want to hear about all the things happening in Vegas. I guess Brandon Miller is not doing great. The curse of the number two. Scoot Henderson got hurt. A lot of guys are getting hurt. It's not great, but we have lots to talk to, including Zion Williamson makes an appearance on Gilbert Arenas' show. And hey, it's the 20 year anniversary of LeBron James's debut at Summer League. So we'll talk about that, but first. You are listening to The Agenda with Tom Haberstro and Amin El Hassan. Victor Wembenyama, Wemby, the debut. I mean, you were there. We've been to huge summer league debuts before. Mm-hmm. Give me the vibes. What were the vibes like for Victor Wembenyama? And was he purposely missing shots and being soft in game one to kind of reset our expectations so we can stop all the hype? Was he purposely missing shots and being soft? Oh, man. Yes. <laughs> so first of all, let me describe the atmosphere with a little story, right? The story of Summer League and why number one versus number two play at Thomas and Mac. Once upon a time, Vegas Summer League was a cult classic, right? Yeah. People who knew came and knew they could come here and you could see tomorrow's legends today and see yesterday's legends walking around the concourse and all that stuff. While it was a good crowd, it was a modest crowd. So A fixture of Summer League is they like to have the number one pick play against the number two pick. That's the marquee game, usually in the opening weekend, either Friday or Saturday. They put that game at the end of the night. It's usually one of the later games. The headliner. Yeah, when you pay for tickets, you get general admission and you stay all day. It's a day pass, more than a ticket. So they would put it the last game of the day and they used to play at Cox Pavilion, which is the secondary gym, the smaller gym that is more like a high school gym, really, than a college gym. Yeah. That was because they wanted it to look packed, full of energy and bursting so it looked good on TV. And then in 2014, Jabari Parker and Andrew Wiggins, Wiggins was one, Parker was two. People have been talking about them all year long, tanking for Wiggins, sorry for Jabari, all that stuff. So it was a very hyped matchup. Get to the Summer League, 
put him in the Cox Pavilion gym, and it was pandemonium. It was like, remember those Rucker games in the early 2000s where people were like literally hanging off fences and stuff? Yeah. It was standing room only. There was a line out of the gym to get in. And I'm talking about team personnel people couldn't get in. They had to sneak in through the back elevator from the loading dock just to get a glimpse. And so that was the moment when Albert Hall and Warren Legary, the guys who co-founded Summer League and still manage and operate it, said, this thing is too big for Cox Pavilion. Next year, we got to start doing it in the big gym, Thomas and Mac. Thomas and Mac is like an 18,000 seat. That's where UNLV basketball plays. But games there were always, they felt less than because even if you had 5,000 people in there, it's so big and cavernous. Mm -hmm. It was always quiet. You could hear everything. Starting the next year, they started putting people in there, the one versus two, but they had the tarps in the upper deck. Shots to the Oakland A's, yep. So Thomas and Max starts getting filled up in the lower bowl. It's not all sold out, but it was pretty decent. And then Lonzo Ball happened. And the year Lonzo Ball was the number two pick with a lot of hype to the Lakers. Actually, I take that back. It started when the Lakers started getting these lottery picks. So I think it was Russell in 2015. D'Angelo, Ingram, Lonzo. And with each iteration, the Lakers summer league submission got more and more hype because they kept bringing real players as opposed to like invites and stuff. And so Laker fans, because the Lakers are terrible, would come to Summer League and because the Lakers would actually be playing with NBA players, they'd be good. And so this was like the one opportunity for Laker fans to see their team actually win stuff. So what you started seeing was people driving from L.A. and also Vegas has a lot of Laker fans here. Thomas and Matt got more and more full. And then the year Alonzo Ball came out, they took down the tarp and now Upper Deck was getting some action. Not filled, but there's enough people in there in pockets. And so this was the trajectory of growth for Summer League until 2019 when Zion happened. Oof. And that was the first time every single seat was filled. And there was an anticipation. Zion ended Kevin Knox's career with one of the most memorable Summer League plays ever. He ripped the ball from him and then he dunked it so hard that an earthquake literally happened. <laughs> yeah. Robinson tapped it out to Knox. Zion rips it. It's an home. In the gym. Kevin Knox looks like he's got a corral. Mr. Williamson says, no, sir. Let me show you how I do it. The building is Shaking. swaying just a little bit. There was a 6.6 .6 measured earthquake and in California here, Mark, right just so. yesterday. And we can feel tremors here well, they, in the, the building. The score clock, score clock is, is shifting ever so slightly. So people are heading to the exits as we speak. So it felt like, oh, shit. Summer League has turned a corner and now it's this phenomenon. And then 2020, COVID happens and it's canceled. And 2021, the season is delayed. So Summer League has to be in August. And oh, by the way, also all these COVID restrictions on how many people can be here and tested, not tested, and all that stuff. And then last year, we got a regular Summer League, but I said it felt like 2013 all over again before Wiggins and Parker. Oh, it's a cult classic thing. Yeah. And then Friday night at Thomas and Mac, we were back to Zion levels. And that was the atmosphere. The atmosphere was crazy and every seat was filled. But there was more of a gawking curiosity of like when he walked out on the court, everybody gasped. <gasps> Because, again, he's so freakish to look at, his dimensions, right? Of course, Mina Kimes did it, but she said it so brilliantly. It's, he looks like a daddy long legs out there. Yeah. And the other thing is, like, Zion, we'd seen him at Duke. So it wasn't this anticipation of, like, what is he going to be like? Yeah. Victor Wembanyama, for NBA junkies, we had that Scoot versus Wemby thing a few months ago. But in an NBA uniform, like, we haven't seen that before. We haven't seen Victor Wembanyama play with other NBA players, or at least in pro action here stateside? Well, I would say for most of those people in that building, they'd never seen it. Yes. I get these people are huge fans, but like how many people are tuning into that Scoot versus Wemby game? This was their first opportunity to just see him play, period, right? I hear about this guy. He's super hype. Let me see what the hype is about. But the other thing is, uh, it's the best way I can explain it. Earlier that day, that same day, Taco Fall was playing for the Bucks Summer League. And when Taco Fall, who's seven six, so he's taller than Women Yama, walks in, I was looking at him and I thought to myself, if I didn't have the context of other people around him, other players around him, I wouldn't know how tall Taco. I was like, oh yeah, he looks like a tall basketball player, like seven foot, right? 
But it's like when he's standing next to other players, like, Jesus, this guy's huge. I think with Wembenyama, even if he was on a white background with no objects around him for any sort of frame of reference, he still looks ridiculous, man. He looks all long and spindly. He looks like, what's the nightmare before Christmas? Jack <laughs> Skellington? <laughs> yes, he looks like Jack Skellington. So when he walked out there, there was an audible gasp. Like, ah! It's like seeing Bigfoot. Right? I think Wemby for me, it was the anticipation of how they're going to deploy him because he is 7'5". I think we can say he's 7'5", but I'm still seeing 7'3 and 7'4 and 7'5". But the thing that jumped out to me was that he was mostly a guard. Like they were putting him in positions on the wing. They didn't have him post up in that first game. And while there were moments of him being overwhelmingly big, he can block shots from the other side of the floor. With his elbow. And he did block Brandon Miller's three-pointer. I was surprised to see how much he looked like he was, I wouldn't even say Porzingis style, but he was just playing outside in rather than inside out. This is what I would say about Wemenyama. First of all, physically, he reminds me a lot of, at the same age, Brandon Ingram. In the sense that Brandon Ingram was a good basketball player with good instincts, who wasn't afraid to attack the rim and attack the paint. But also, Brandon Ingram weighed like 92 pounds. Yeah. And when you're that skinny, you're that slight, it's hard to impose your will offensively because you just don't have the physicality to overcome the point of impact. Guys can put their hand on your hip and push you out. And so you get rerouted. And even though your intention is to drive directly to the basket, you end up going outward because people are literally pushing you away. So he doesn't have the strength to do that. Same thing or run down the floor in deep seal. He can't because guys won't even allow him to get to those spots. He can't. He doesn't physically have the capacity to stop or to impose his will. And then the other part of it is, and this is the interesting part, I realized very quickly that nobody in the crowd knew that he can't shoot. He's not a good shooter. <laughs> he looks like a good shooter. He's got great form. He's got great arc. It just hasn't gone in at, at a high percentage. Yeah. Yeah. If we remove context of seeing the ball actually go to the basket, you're just looking at him go through his motion. It's a perfect stroke. It's fluid, high release point, all that. It doesn't go in. And I was having this argument with one of the other guys here. I'm like, look, man, what's the definition of a great shooter? And my friend is tough. Well, if you did it, I'm like, no, it's really easy. Did he make it? <laughs> yeah. He didn't make it. He's not a good shooter. Sorry. That's the only metric we can have for this it's not a beauty pageant and so while he's 10 out of 10 in the beauty pageant he's three out of 10 shooting yeah and so he can't shoot from the outside and he can't get to the inside i kind of understood it's gonna be hard for him to be good out the gate i think he was nervous too he, he admitted as such afterward but then the second game the shot falls and as we saw with julius randall in the 2021 season if you're a guy who can't shoot and then all of a sudden you're making shots, it makes life a lot easier for you to do the things that you do want to do in terms of getting to the rim and all that stuff. He hit some shots and so the defense adjusted and that opened up other things for him. So all in all, I thought he did okay. I thought he did a really good job in that second game. But overall, a couple of things that jumped out to me in terms of his stats or in terms of his production in summer league. Historically, guys who are that hyped and that big, they have an incredibly difficult time staying out of foul trouble at Summer League. They're fouling everybody. The one that comes to mind is Greg Oden had 10 fouls in his debut. 10 fouls? How can you get 10 fouls? Literally 10 fouls. And in the second game, after he got drafted number one overall by Portland, Greg Oden had nine fouls. So Greg Oden, in his first two games at Summer League for the Blazers, had 19 fouls. And Victor Wembanyama, even though he looked kind of out of sync, didn't have his conditioning right, he didn't seem to be overwhelmed physically in the sense that he can't make up for his lack of strength with his length. Like Victor Wembanyama has an eight foot wingspan. Even if he gets pushed around, mm -hmm. he's still able to block shots and get rebounds that are not even remotely near his vicinity. There was a play where he shot a runner on the left baseline, recovered the rebound on the right baseline, tipped it to himself, and then 
finished an and one all of one motion. He didn't do the putback on a three pointer, but to me, it was just as mind boggling to watch. We never really see that a guy who's physically capable of shooting a runner baseline runner far out on the left side and then recover it just inside the three point line on the right side. And he did it. It's like a nerf hoop for him. It's crazy. Like when you're in your dorm room and you got that nerf hoop, you go up on one side. Oh, you get it back on the other side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The thing I saw was stuff like in basketball, you're an offensive player. You're trying to get the defense to commit to a point where like you can't recover and then throw it somewhere else and be like, all right, that guy should get a wide open shot. And he's able to close ground with a ridiculous amount of speed because he's so long. There was that play where he's coming down the court and the guy goes up and the guy was like, there's no way. I feel for the offensive player. I was like, there's no way this dude's going to catch him. No, he can't. He blocked it with his elbow. Yeah. He caught up and overshot it almost. Yeah. Based on his length. So I think he's going to get a lot of blocks and steals simply based off of people not expecting anyone to be physically possible to do that. In the same way that in like 2016, 17, Steph got a lot of open threes because no one thought anyone would try pulling up from there. They have to recalibrate basketball. Exactly. What they know about basketball, they have to relearn the game. Oh, wait, this guy can't pull up from 40 feet in transition. That's a shot he can make. In the same way that Brandon Miller was like, oh, this dude is sagging behind the three-point line. I'm going to pull up from 28, and he gets blocked. Like, you could park a car between Brandon Miller and Victor Wembanyama, and still Wemby blocked the shit out of it. You know what I thought about? I thought about in the 2017 finals, the game that the Warriors won at Cleveland where Durant came down and LeBron was guarding him. Yeah. But LeBron was like sagging back and Durant just rose up and shot. Boom. I thought about that play and I said, I think Wembenyama with the same placement and spacing could have blocked that shot from Durant. Yep. <laughs> yeah. There are going to be guys who are going to do that. Let me just pull. He's sagging off me. He's all the way down at the free throw line. And here he comes and he blocks it. So he had five blocks in 27 minutes in game one. He had a couple more blocks in game two. The assists in game one were like really impressive. Whereas he didn't have the same sort of playmaking game two. And I think that was a good thing. I think he shifted into a more aggressive mode and he was hitting threes mm -hmm. and feeling a little bit more comfortable out there. But if you look at his per 36 numbers in two games, I know it seems ridiculous that I'm doing that, but just to give you an idea of the kind of production, even with a bad game in game one, He's 24, 13, and five. And the five is not assist. The five is blocks. Mm. So Victor Weminyama, even with a stinker in game one, a dud where he shot two or 13 from the floor, he's still 23 points, 13 rebounds, and five blocks per 36 minutes. So he's still able to produce. He didn't have the kind of turnovers we typically see with guys who are handling the ball that much. He's got much better handle than anyone we've seen at that size. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really have that many NBA players around him. So it's also in the context of, Hey, I got to close out on this dude and I got to leave Victor women. I got to make some tough decisions about who I'm going to guard here. I think he's going to get easier looks come NBA regular season. Yeah. We talk about this every year. If you're a big guy at summer league, relax on having a great summer league because first of all, you got to deal with guards. Most of the time aren't NBA guards. Second of all, guards who are trying to prove themselves and how guards prove themselves in these settings. Are usually ah, 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 like they're trying to do too much <laughs> as opposed to give the big guy who's the number one overall pick the ball. If you had asked me a couple months ago when he was drafted, if we'd ever see him at Vegas, much less two full games, I would have said you're nuts. Considering he was just playing in the postseason for the French league, I would have thought you're not seeing him at summer league. And of course he comes out not just for one game, but he plays two full games and now he's heading home for what he said. He's going to just go on vacation and you're not going to see me for a month. Good. I'm happy for him. We spent, I don't know how many minutes of this, sh this show, not talking about Britney Spears, but how the heck I've been sitting here waiting to get to that <laughs> part. <laughs> the main event. I'm letting you guys do your potent basketball analysis that I'm trying to get to the real, real shit that went down <laughs> on Friday, which is Britney Spears approached Wemby, which this is my favorite part. Yeah. She's an NBA head. Is she? She is apparently. Yeah. How often do you even hear about famous celebrities approaching first round picks of the NBA in Vegas and the alleged slap smack, whatever you want to call it battery as she's pressing charges, perhaps 
what a story. I love the thing that no dunks did where they went around the pavilion. Obviously you're in a NBA summer league environment, but they're asking people who they'd rather have a picture with Wemby or Britney Spears. <laughs> Wemby surprisingly strong push. Oh yeah. Most people said Wemby. They'd rather be seen with Wemby, even though they'd have a picture of them at his waist. I have a friend who is in security executive production and we asked him about this and this is what he said i've done that exact move 1000 times <laughs> no one would care if it wasn't britney spears britney spears wouldn't care if she wasn't drunk and embarrassed Ooh. oh man <laughs> he basically kept forward motion and swatted her hand he's under no obligation to know she's a celebrity running up and her security would have done the same thing yes now the skill is how you handle it afterwards because you could be super apologetic hit him with some humor or I'm just doing my job. However, oh no. <laughs> have you seen her IG the last couple of years? She doesn't come across as someone that you can hit with some logic or humor and be like, oh, you know, it's all good or whatever. Is she in Victor Wembanyama's universe is really what I want to understand. That's a great question. He's 19 years old. So I would say no. He's born in 2004. Brittany is a special case of pop star because... Her presence now, her presence in the last decade, musically, is essentially nothing. Right. She had Las Vegas residency, which puts her on like a Wayne Newton tier. Yeah. yeah. Like if you asked somebody who was young around Wayne Newton, you wouldn't know that Wayne Newton was anything other than a Vegas show act. Dude, that's a perfect, because I know who Wayne Newton is. I know what he looks like. I've seen him on TV, making cameos on shows. I know us, Wayne Newton, that's a dude from Vegas. I can't name a single Wayne Newton song. Yeah. I don't even know, is it country? Is it pop of that day? Or like, is it doo-wop? I don't know what he sounds like. Dark as shame, darling, dark as shame. Thank you for all the joy and pain. Picture show, second balcony. Watch the place we'd meet. Second seat, go Dutch treat. You were sweet. You know what I was gonna say? I said, Oh, the only Wade Newton song I know is It's Not Unusual. But I'm like, No, that's not Wade Newton, that's Tom Jones. <laughs> Tom Jones, Jones. <laughs> it would be probably very similar to Women Yama. I'm sure he knows who she is. Like, Oh, yeah, Britney Spears. But like, I can't name a song. And by the way, even if you did, even if he was the biggest Britney fan, hit me, baby, one more time. And Oops, I did again. And all them songs, whatever, right? The Britney Spears that sung them songs do not look like the Britney Spears that ran up on them outside of catch. She looked crazy, bro. I'm sorry, man. And I get it. Britney fans are like, oh. Yeah, this gives us an opportunity to dust off the Leave Britney Alone video. And how fucking dare anyone out there make fun of Britney after all she's been through. Her song is called Give Me More for a Reason because all you people want is more, 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 more. Leave her alone. You're lucky she even performed for you bastards. Leave Britney alone. Please. Leave Britney Spears alone right now. It felt like Mad Libs to me, guys. It felt like Mad Libs. When it came across on TMZ, I still remember reading it and being like, wait, wait, wait. This isn't some sort of joke. This isn't an onion story that Victor Wembanyama's security was accused of assaulting Britney Spears outside of a Vegas hotel. And then when you were just saying it, it occurred to me, hit me baby one more time. The idea of that being her hit and then this story happening, how many jokes could have been had in that moment, but it was in poor form. Oops, I did it again. It's almost like all of Britney's songs had a bad pun associated with this one event. I got an update here I forgot to mention. So my buddy who does security said, I did the same thing to a guy when I was working with insert celebrity, very big celebrity musical act. He said the musical act was hosting a skating party and was on skates and about to get on the floor. I was behind him and then a big ass hand reached over my shoulder to grab the musical act's shoulder and I swatted it away. Same thing he said. And then when I turned around, it was Magic Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> but he ain't released a statement to TMZ, though. No, he didn't. So Victor Wambanyama, still good. 
Still eight foot wingspans, still completely baffling. Strong take, Tom. Yeah, thank you. Well, <laughs> was it Jay King? Jay King, who said he's just basically a tall, skinnier Andre Drummond, which was an amazing, <laughs> amazing troll. Fantastic. Look, man, he's going to be fun to talk about forever. What are the troll comps? Let's do this. Sean Bradley with a jump shot. I think that was Nick Wright that said that, right? Threw that out off the top of my head, but I'm sure that it's been said before. No, he stole it from Anthony Mays. I'm going with that one because Nick Wright has has a track record. Oh, I feel like our guy Miles Brown had a few good ones. JaVale McGee with a little better handle. We oui, Jean Leon. We oui as <laughs> French. Oh, we. Oui. Yes. Uh, oh, that's a really good one. Yeah. <laughs> Macaroon Murison. <laughs> <laughs> Brule Boban. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Un petit Porzingis. <laughs> Streets saying that the Britney bopper is a bust. Baguette Bradley ain't got it. Bonjour, bowl <laughs> coming up small. Oh my God. <laughs> Bonjour, bowl. Oh, man. Tall guy puns. So, Wemby's being shut down, and I feel like people are predictably overreacting to the first game as I'm sitting here doing per 36 numbers. I'm doing per 36 minute numbers on two games in summer league. That's great. It's just fantastic. Other people are overreacting. You're saying. Yeah, exactly. This is what I love, man. You know, I love to get up and get dressed in my finest tuxedo, put on a monocle and a top hat, grab a cane, grab my lady on my arm and head on down to the finest, most sophisticated art form there is. A night at the small sample size theater. Theater. <laughs> rah, nah, rah. <laughs> Cheerio. Hello, listener. It is your favorite Butcher Turn podcast producer Mays here to talk to you about Butcher Box. One of the biggest holidays on the Butcher calendar is Thanksgiving. I can tell you from the front lines of slinging turkeys that it gets hectic at the grocery store during Thanksgiving. And that's why your search for the perfect Thanksgiving entree ends with Butcher Box. Take the stress out of holiday meal prep with your choice of humanely raised whole turkey turkey breast or ham free in your first order plus get twenty dollars off when you go to butcherbox.com slash dings and enter code dings at checkout sign up today and get ready for your easiest thanksgiving yet delivered right to your door order by november 19th to guarantee delivery by thanksgiving spend less time at the grocery store and more time enjoying the holidays with your family go to butcherbox.com slash dings and enter code dings d-i-n-g-s at checkout to get this offer plus twenty dollars off your first box hey listener guess what you can spark something uncommon this holiday with just the right gift from our friends at uncommon goods the busy holiday season is here and Uncommon Goods makes it less stressful with incredible hand-picked gifts for everyone on your list. Yep, mom, dad, sister, brother, anybody. Weird uncle, doesn't matter. All in one spot. Gifts that spark joy, wonder, delight, and that, that's exactly what I wanted feeling. They scour the globe for original, handmade, absolutely remarkable things. Somehow, they know exactly the perfect gift for every single person you know. How crazy is that? It's like a big jolly guy that just knows what to do. Here are a few of my favorite gifts that I found on their site. You know, I had to get me a California spoon rest. You can do like embroidered stuff. Going to do that for my parents or for their dogs, you know, some pet embroidered sweatshirts and t-shirts and stuff. And the piece de resistance for all of our fans who also love football, that football bingo set of two that we can all enjoy every Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Thursday, whenever they got football games for you. When you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses. Many of their handcrafted products are made in small batches. So shop now before they sell out this holiday season. And with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they give back $1 to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than $3 million to date. Let's get that number up by buying from Uncommon Goods. How do you do that, you ask? I'm so glad you posited that query. To get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash dings. That's uncommongoods.com slash dings, D-I-N-G-S, for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. What does that look like? You doing your own research. Are you doing studies yourself? Are you in the lab on a nightly basis? What are you doing? Do your own research. Do your own research. Do your own research. Do your own research. Doing your own research. 
I'm not a scientist. I'm not here to tell everyone that this is it. For me, it's just um, just giving everyone a chance to do their own research and find their own knowledge. All right, Wemby, terrible. Two of 13 field goals in his debut had three turnovers. Awful. Get rid of him. He might not even play for the Austin Toros at this point. The Austin Spurs. They haven't been Austin Toros in like eight years. Well, they will be now. Okay. <laughs> not since Luke Bonner played for them. <laughs> <laughs> Our guy, Luke. That's a deep cut. I mean, I wanted to ask you because I'm kind of going through the annals of the internet mm-hmm. to find the most impressive performances at summer league and a one Marcus banks scoring 42 points mm-hmm. in 2007 comes up quite a bit. And I'm wondering before I get into some of my research, if you have any memories from the Phoenix suns as Marcus banks, dropping a 40 burger at summer league. And he showed up in a Lamborghini because <laughs> you got to realize this is Marcus banks already on his second contract. He showed up, he dropped 42, and he played at UNLV. Obviously, there's a difference there. But Marcus wasn't always the greatest fit for us. And so we were trying to see, like, maybe we get him to play in summer league, it'll get his confidence, though, because he had a tough first season in Phoenix. That's not the best ever, right? Like, the best ever, I thought it was either Anthony Randolph or Anthony Morrow. I remember they went dueling ridiculous games, right? 40s. Yeah. So Anthony Randolph, the summer of Anthony Randolph, is maybe the go-to summer league cautionary tale no there's one that's more cautionary than that what josh selby or something like that josh selby is the (laughs) ultimate because josh selby was the number one player in his high school class he goes to kansas he doesn't get along with bill self he leaves after his freshman year he's a second round pick he comes to summer league and he drops a 40 piece and everyone's like see josh selby's that dude and he was never heard from again at least anthony randolph had like a meaningful nba career of sorts, and then ended up having a really great high-level European career playing for Real Madrid. Mm -hmm. Tell me one more thing about Josh Selby after that Summer League. I was just going to say, I mean, can you name who he was co-MVP with of Summer League that year, Josh Selby? 2012. Was it Damian Lillard? And there it is, folks. The first mention of Damian Lillard on this episode of Basketball Illuminati comes in at the 32 and a half minute mark plus some commercials. How about that? We did it, guys. Take the over. Way over. Yeah. Way over. I thought for sure we'd be leading with Damian Lillard again for the third straight week. But no, it is only in reference to the GOAT of Summer League. Josh Selby. There is no rush to bring up Damian Lillard on this podcast. No rush. Nope. No rush. We might wait months to bring up Damian Lillard. Take the over. It could take months before we mention him. Okay. Anthony Randolph, Anthony Morrow in 2009. Oh, that was yes. Steph Curry's year. Yes. Steph Curry's year. Who? He goes number seven overall. He's a sensation at Davidson. And yet he's overshadowed by not one, but two teammates. Two Anthony's. Two Anthony's. One of whom, by the way, was his teammate on his AAU team. Anthony Morrow. <laughs> when Anthony Morrow and Steph Curry played on the same AAU team, Anthony Morrow was that guy. And mm. Steph Curry was just a kid who was trying to get looks as well. And so imagine Steph Curry, like however many years later, you drafted your top 10 pick. You go to summer league. My buddy, you're undrafted free agent. What up? Cool. Isn't this great? We're together. And then you go play and you're Steph Curry and he shoots like 32% or whatever during summer league. Meanwhile, it's like old times all over again. Everyone's talking about Morrow, 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 Morrow. Tony, Tony, Tony Morrow. Get it? I feel like Anthony Randolph, it'd be a way different experience if his name is Tony Randy. But anyway, Victor Wembanyama, nine <laughs> points, two for 13 field goals, eight rebounds, three assists, three turnovers, five blocks in 27 minutes. Kobe Bryant. I mean, do you remember Kobe Bryant's Summer League debut? No, nah, man. That was before Summer League was something that was easy to track. His Summer League debut was at Long Beach, or where was it? Yes. One of these days, we should do like a, a history of Summer League. It is pretty interesting how Albert Hall and Warren Legary basically nuked every. <laughs> <laughs> they created the Death Star, and they just said, ew, shot a laser and destroyed every other Summer League. Kobe Bryant had 27 points in his debut in 26 minutes. Get this. 
He went 18 of 20 from the free throw line in his summer league debut. 17 years old, had 20 free throws. He was fouled 10 times by Greg Oden. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, maybe Greg Oden was that old. So even back then, Kobe was getting the benefit of the whistle from these lousy (laughs) refs. All right. I mean, I'm going to text you this quote because in Justin Verrier's ringer piece, revisiting the Kobe Bryant summer league, he has a quote from our guy, Alvin Gentry, talking about Kobe Bryant's performance. And I want to hear Amin as Alvin Gentry, limited faith. I, I think this kid's a tremendous athlete, okay? I don't want to compare anybody to Jordan, but he's Jordan-like in the way that he makes spectacular plays, the way he can get a shot, the way he can handle the ball. He's got a great court temperament. <laughs> then Pistons assistant coach, Alvin Gentry. This is also young Alvin Gentry. That's the other mm-hmm. thing you got to remember. Like, yeah. this is... Alvin has had one head job in the league at this point. I think it was Miami. And he had come to Detroit under Duck Collins. This is the same corollary of like, I mean, no disrespect. And then you disrespect someone. I don't want to compare anybody to Jordan. But he was Jordan-like in the way he was making spectacular plays. We also have Stephen Curry. Like I said, his debut was overshadowed by Anthony Randolph and Anthony Morrow taking the world by storm. Stephen Curry, a quiet 16 points, four for 14 field goals, shooting five of six from the free throw line, three assists to four turnovers in 36 minutes. A story by Marcus Thompson, the second. No way. Says, I give myself a C. Stephen Curry, the quote given to Marcus Thompson from way back in 2009, our friend of the program writing, I don't know what newspaper he's... Wasn't it like San Jose Mercury News or something like that? (laughs) I think it was Oakland maybe at this point. What's the Oakland paper that would have been in 2009 covering this? Oakland Tribune? Maybe. Contra Costa Times? The Contra Costa. (laughs) Yes. A lot of people were comparing Victor Wembenyama defensively as Rudy Gobert. I am not giving you the Rudy Gobert summer league debut. We do not need that on this program. What we do want to hear, how did Kevin Durant do? Offensively, some people saying he looks a lot like Kevin Durant. Here's his line. 18 points, five of 17 from the floor, one of four from three. He had one rebound, zero assists, zero steals, zero blocks, and one turnover in 30 minutes. Kevin Durant for the Supersonics with Jeff Green making his debut. Zion Williamson, as you alluded to, Zion Williamson, his summer league debut ended Kevin Knox's career before it even started. He had 11 points, three rebounds in nine minutes because he got that knee contusion or that leg contusion that our guy, David Griffin, basically said out of an abundance of caution, we are going to hold him out for the rest of summer league. And that was a huge bummer. Blake Griffin, 27 points, 11 of 15 field goals. Four of eight from the free throw line, 12 rebounds, five turnovers in 29 minutes. Carl Anthony Towns almost pulled a Greg Oden, had nine fouls in 32 minutes, 12 points, three rebounds, four assists, four turnovers. Lonzo Ball, I don't think anyone should be compared to Wemby, but I'll compare him to Wemby. A Wemby like two of 15 from the floor. Lonzo Ball, three turnovers. In Vegas, like you said, I mean, it was a crazy crowd for that one, and he stuck up the joint. But my favorite, Greg Oden, six points, two rebounds, 10 fouls in 20 minutes, and nine fouls in his second game. Which brings us to the one comp that I think everyone in Vegas was alluding to, LeBron James. We are illumination out there. On the 20th anniversary of LeBron James's summer league debut, in Vegas, no. I mean... Do you remember where LeBron James had his summer league debut in July of 2003? Orlando. It was Orlando. Very good. The Pepsi something or other Orlando showcase. (laughs) The Pepsi. LeBron James made his debut. It was $5 tickets. This is pre Warren Legary and Albert Hall taking over. Orlando season ticket holders were able to go for free. And then they opened it up for like 4,000 seats to general admission, $5 a ticket. And it was going for way more than that scalping and sports center was covering it. I watched a 12 minute mini documentary from Maximilian who I used to work with at true TV. My guy, Max, one of the best video editors of all time. Yeah. And the thing I forgot was LeBron James was dunked on 
by none other than Britton Johnson. Oh, yeah, I remember that kid. <laughs> From Utah, right? Played for Orlando? <laughs> yeah. Am I right? Yes. Victor Wimbanyama baptized into the NBA by Kai Jones just the same way that LeBron James was baptized by Britton Johnson, who... I don't know if he's Mormon, but he did come from Utah and played at Utah and was 24 years old at summer league when he dunked all over LeBron James. I just love that. So LeBron, his debut was in front of 15,000 fans, roughly the same amount as Wemby did. And watching this clip, it's incredible. He was playing point guard for Paul Silas, him, Darius Miles, Dewan Wagner, Carlos Boozer, and Sagana Jop. That was the starting five for the Cavs that year at Summer League, which is basically an NBA team. That is, yeah. Was that their starting five for their next season? Ricky Davis wasn't. But yes, what you just illustrated is one of my favorite Summer League things. When some teams bring their Summer League team to Summer League and some people bring their actual regular season team to Summer League. Like the Pistons this year? Yeah, Pistons this year, a great example. The Rockets are another good example. Yep. I remember we once lost a game to the Wizards and then afterwards went to this dinner with a lot of other team people. And I want to say is either the trainer, the equipment manager from the Wizards was talking shit about how bad they beat us. And I said, mother <laughs> you brought your opening night roster. <laughs> it's the varsity versus the JV team. Of course you're going to whip up on us. Not even. This is the varsity against like the kids at the tryout. In this AP story about LeBron James's summer league debut in Orlando, it says in the crowd were NBA players. Now here's the A-list celebrity row here. Drew Gooden, Chucky Atkins, Jason Williams, Amari Stoudemire, Stephen Hunter. Good rebounder. And Dante Culpepper. Oh, get your roll on. Wow. So there was an air ball. He got dunked on by Britton Johnson. He had 14 points. Five of 11 from the floor, seven rebounds, six assists, three turnovers in just 23 minutes. Hell of a stat line for Brent Johnson. But how did LeBron do? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, all I want to say here is LeBron James didn't have like a mind blowing debut. Same way that Victor Wembanyama didn't. He had moments of greatness were flashes of brilliance LeBron playing point guard for a team with Darius miles and Carlos Boozer. Those dudes were NBA players, not one NBA player next to Victor Wembanyama. So it's kind of hard to grade it. Am I a Victor Wembanyama apologist already? Sounds like it. Okay. You and the rest of the mainstream media, Tom brainwashed <laughs> carrying RC Buford's water. Brittany deserved it. Whoa. 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 Sorry. Whoa. Sorry. That was what I didn't say that. <laughs> Wait a minute. That was the mainstream media infiltrating my brain. <laughs> That's Michelle Beadle levels. I once did a show sports station with Michelle Beadle where we played a clip of somebody complaining about something and some athlete was complaining about either not getting calls or the media is not covering them correctly, whatever. And we're supposed to like react off the video and we come out of the video and Michelle says, what a bitch. And then turns around and acts as if someone said it behind. What? What did you say? Yes, yeah, she did. <laughs> so that's my research. I looked up 10 different dudes, summer league debuts, and learned a couple things about them. One is that Kobe Bryant was Kobe Bryant from the beginning at 17 years old. There's no doubt about it. Von Wafer also scored 42 points against the Knicks in 2007. And there you have it. Von Wafer on Basketball Illuminati. You're welcome. Victor Wembanyama is wafer thin. Same initials. Volkswagen. On wafer. Victor Wembanyama. Victor Wembanyama. I'm the biggest Wake Forest fan there is, and I still did not see Jeff T becoming an amazing podcaster. He's got great stories, dude. He's a great storyteller, man. The T-Mac one? Did you see the T-Mac one? I was in uh, my third year. I was starting point guard. He came to our team, and he was really pissed that I was starting. Tell him how I pulled up to practice. What did he pull up in? <laughs> A Maybach? Yeah. yeah, he pulled up in a Maybach. I'm like, you know, I'm a fan. I'm like, damn, that's T-Mac in a Maybach with some big-ass Gucci clothes on. 
<laughs> I'm like, damn, what up? He was like, what's up? They start calling the star line of the groups. Nigga look like, this nigga? I'm like, yeah. Yeah, he like, man, this nigga trash. <laughs> I'm like, <sighs> heart drop, like, oh, he got me fucked up. <laughs> so that was fuck T back the whole <laughs> I just started talking shit to him the rest of the year. Like, yeah, yeah. you ain't never been LeBron. Oh. Kobe ain't respect you. <laughs> he was like, nigga, who the fuck are you? <laughs> I ain't had shit to say. I just kept talking shit about other niggas. Like, Kobe, man, he said you ain't work hard enough. <laughs> nigga. You average eight motherfucking points. <laughs> He'd go in over here every day. Then that nigga stole me my chest one day. Damn. I wanted to fight that nigga so bad. That nigga Marvin Williams was like, man, he'll beat the shit out of you, man. Relax. It's funny because I can hear Tracy's voice in my head saying this shit. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's definitely. <laughs> definitely T-Mac. Tracy McGrady is one of the weirdest dudes because he is simultaneously ridiculously Humble doesn't even begin to describe. It. He's ridiculously unaware of his greatness. Tracy once told me, I think we were talking about Brandon Ingram, and we were talking about skinny players, and like, yeah, those guys like Ingram and Durant, and me, I'm like, Tracy, you were skinny for like two years, and then the rest of the, your career, you were like, no, I was a skinny guy. I'm like, Tracy, you had this vein yeah. coming out of here. <laughs> the vein. So I think he looks in the mirror, and he sees the same skinny kid when he got drafted. He doesn't see like, what he became. But at the same time, he's got this pride about him, like shit like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that motherfucker can't play. <laughs> this one on Steph killed me. Yeah, I remember we played Steph in China, right? <laughs> Wait, what? We went to China. We played, we played KD, Steph, them niggas. Man, I uh, swear to God, anyway. I played the best defense, the hardest defense I ever played in my life. Why? Nigga, I was trying to like, I wasn't trying to get embarrassed. You know, it's a hundred thousand people in the stands in China. Oh, no, like China, Chinese, that's bro. crazy. Yeah. Honestly, <laughs> respect. So I'm like, fuck that. He ain't about to kill me. Bro, I swear to God, I play. So I've never played this hard. See, if after the game came to me, that's the best defense I ever played. Steph Curry had 44. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Let's get Jeff T going, man. The delivery is unbelievable, dude. And then as I'm watching these videos of Jeff T, it's, I guess, the 520 podcast. I'm like, man. I can't get enough of these stories. Like the only guy who's maybe as good of a storyteller, maybe KG, he's great at it. DeMarcus Cousins, surprisingly really good at this podcasting thing. But Gilbert Arenas has got to be the GOAT. He's so good at storytelling. All the anecdotes from back when he was playing, he's electric. And I spat out the proverbial coffee when I watched the Zion Williamson coming onto the set and what Gilbert Arenas did was hysterical to me. They're at Vegas. They're in their studios. They're taping Josiah. It's Rashad McCants, who's huge now. He's just Jack. And then Brandon Jennings. They're on set taping live. And in walks Zion Williams. Zion. Zion. <laughs> he about to run up yeah. on all of us. Yeah. 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 We've been talking about you, Keith. We're just talking about you. What's up, bro? What's up, bro? Hey, man. My man. Yeah. You good? You know he good. <laughs> you know he good. <laughs> Pull up a chair. <laughs> right, right. Pull up a chair. Yeah, man. <laughs> we were just talking about you, man. I'm, I'm trying to vouch for you, man. Like, hey, you got the discipline. You're going to go in there. You're going to change your body. But this nigga Gil just feels like, hey, hey the temptation yeah. is Bruh. too strong. No, no it's not. He going to he gonna come back stronger than ever. Is it hard to diet at your age? Uh... Jeez. Be honest. Since it's you, I'll be real. Uh, there are times when I will say that, man, that shit hard. Mm -hmm. it's hard. It's hard, man. Like, you 20, 22, got a lot of money. All the, It feel like all the money in the world, man. It, it is hard, but uh, I'm at that point now where because of certain things, I'm putting back, like, the wisdom around me, a bunch mm -hmm. of, like, I don't want to say older because they take offense to it. <laughs> and I'm just putting people around me with wisdom, put me on game to certain things, and just go from there. Though. They start telling him, I mean, that he's looking real thin and looking like he's kept off the weight. I don't necessarily agree, but it was just amazing to me to watch Zion Williamson so happy coming onto the set with his guys, his NBA brethren, and then he gets hit with... Hey, man, is it hard to diet at your age? I was floored that Gil just went straight for it. No, that's Gil, though, man. <laughs> that's Gil. To be fair to Zion, the people that I know that have seen him, they said the same thing. He looks like he lost a lot of weight. So, I mean, 
I guess if you have a lot of weight, you could lose a lot of weight and oh, still look is. like you. Okay. <laughs> I was like, to be fair to Zion. That's not the Amin I know. Amin? What? <laughs> fair? The only fair Amin's talking about is a turkey leg at the county fair. <laughs> <laughs> That's the same fair that Zion's talking about, ironically. 